my name is Nicholas Mignanelli. I'm the head of programming at the William Bowman Law Library and a lecturer in legal research at Yale Law School. Uh, Professor Femi Cadmus, the director of the Law Library, regrets being unable to be here today, but I know she'll be watching the recording. Uh, today, our featured author is Professor Till Reed Amar, and our facilitator is Dr. Andrew Lipka. Professor Amar is Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University, where he teaches constitutional law at both Yale College and Yale Law School. After graduating from Yale College summa cum laude in 1980 and from Yale Law School in 1984 and clerking for judge, later Justice Stephen Breyer, Professor Amar joined the Yale faculty in 1985 at the age of 26. Professor Amar is the author of more than 100 law review articles and several books, most notably The Bill of Rights, America's Constitution, America's Unwritten Constitution, and The Constitution Today. His latest book, The Words That Made Us, America's Constitutional Conversation, 1760 to 1840, is the subject of today's talk. Dr. Andrew Lipka is an active alumnus of Yale College and the Yale School of Medicine. He is the co-host with Professor Amar of America's Constitution, a leading podcast on the constitutional ecosphere. Dr. Lipka is the president of EverScholar, a nonprofit that conducts seminar-based immersive residential programs at the highest level in the US and abroad with top faculty from the world's leading universities. EverScholar grew out of the Yale for Life program for Yale alumni, which Dr. Lipka also led. Dr. Lipka recently retired from career as an ophthalmologist in the Princeton, New Jersey area. He was the chairman of ophthalmology at University Medical Center at Princeton for 25 years, served on the Biomedical Ethics Committee, was the team ophthalmologist for Rutgers football and basketball, and is a longtime member of the clinical faculty at Rutgers Medical School. Thank you both so much for being here today. Thank you. I want to thank the, uh, the Yale Law Library. It's great to be back at Yale uh, for any reason, but um, I can't imagine a better reason than speaking to my, my favorite uh, professor about my favorite book. Um, and uh, so, thank you. Um, so, of course, we know the title, The Words That Made Us, America's Constitutional Conversation, 1760 to 1840. Um, and uh, when I was thinking about what I was going to talk, ask Akil about today, uh, I remembered uh, a story, quick story about myself in eighth grade when the teacher assigned a book called The Mouse That Roared. And uh, then we had to write a surprise essay on it. However, I hadn't read the book. Um, so all I knew was the title. So I wrote a, an essay uh, entirely about the title. Um, <laughs> so today I'm going to start off by asking uh, Akil about the title. Um, you know, so I was thinking about it. Uh, and there's kind of an implication in the title. It actually makes a statement, doesn't it? It says, first of all, that words made us. And by us, I know that you have a bit of a pun there, US. Um, so, OK, words made us. That's not necessarily true of, of other societies. Um, so is that something that's intrinsic and important to America? And that it's not only the words made us, but the words. So, so specific words, um, and those are really two different concepts, I think, and they tie into, I think, you know, themes with newspapers and so forth. So I wanted to ask you a few about that. Um, is that true? Did words make us? Is that important to the book? And what are the specific words that made us? So thanks so much for inviting us both. Um, uh, Andy and I have this free weekly podcast together. It's his brainchild. We have close to 100 episodes. Um, uh, it's, it's free. Um, uh, and um, we have fun guests uh, from um, many of whom are connected to Yale in, in various ways. Bob Woodward and Gary Park, Stephen Myers coming on in the weeks, in the Totenberg, in the greenhouse. But, but sometimes it's just Andy and yours truly talking about things. Um, and and he came up with this, um, uh, the, the the concept. Um, it's whimsically entitled America's Constitution, sort of punish. Um, so yeah, um, first of all, us, and it is a pun, U.S. And that's why even on the cover, it's sort of blue and and red. So it kind of it captures the idea of United States and us. And I just, are we an us? Are we a we? And what do we have in common? And the, my claim fundamentally is here's what we don't have in common as Americans. And uh, uh, well, well, oh, race, ethnicity, um, geography, um, uh, political perspective, um, 
we're very, very um, uh, uh, diverse in all these ways, religion. So what we have in common is a national narrative and um, a national creed uh, and a set of national institutions. This is what we have in common, this and the stuff around it. And if we don't stick to this, not to be too melodramatic, but um, we're Beirut. And that does not end well for us or for the world. And if you don't know this, and most of you, I'm gonna be really assertive, don't, then it's just really difficult for the project to go forward. And the beginning of this book, we're not yet an us. Um, we're not a we, there's no quite concept of America as such. They're just different colonies. They've been founded at different times for different purposes. They have to be, happen to be contiguous geographically, but they have no more in common quite. They're connected to a common crown. They're um, uh, um, founded hundreds of years apart for very different purposes by very different folks. Not that much um, uh, more of an us than, let's say, in 1930, when uh, Queen Elizabeth is uh, 35, when she's just a little girl, the, the late Queen Elizabeth. Well, you got England and Ireland and uh, um, India and Canada and New Zealand and Australia and Kenya, and they're um, all connected to a common crown, but they don't have that much in common with each other. Well, that's America what we call America, that's the new world, the British colonies in America in 1759. There's not a we yet at all. This book talks about how Americans become Americans, what we call Americans, because they're not yet. And, and it is through words, through talking to each other, through newspapers. It's about pictures to images. Political cartoons are really important. They're invented in America by a guy named Ben Franklin. You might have heard of him. He invents the lightning rod. He invents the Franklin stove. Um, Andy is an amazing ophthalmologist. He, um, he invents the bifocals, says Franklin. Um, uh, but, but political cartoons. He invents the world's first viral meme, hashtag join or die. It goes around the world multiple times. And it's a, a, just a very pithy political argument for a democratic culture, because you got to keep it short in a democracy. <laughs> Constitution is short. It's short because it's supposed to be written, uh, published in newspapers, start to finish, so people can read it and decide whether they're for it or against it, talk about it, vote on it, copy it, cut and paste it from one state to another to another. Um, I'm looking at my friends, Jacob and Melissa and Jordan and others. They just helped me on an important uh, brief um, that may uh, be, I hope, significant in maybe the biggest case um, of this term, maybe of uh, this decade, involving thing called independent state legislature doctrine. And one key to the case was a whole bunch of state constitutions that were copying each other, saying elections should be free and equal. Um, and we didn't know that, um, uh, our team, uh, just the significant, how many of them were, there were and how significant they were a week ago. Um, but it was featured front and center of the brief because. These are newspapers that are publishing ideas that then can be copied in other places. Um, so yes, and that's why the font here is it's very 18th century. It looks like a broadside. It's got serifs in it. And um, so it, you can't have the American Constitutional Project without new, newspapers and literacy and people talking to each other in big ways. We talk ourselves into nationhood, but if you don't know that narrative, if you don't know that story, we can't continue the project um, and, and the thing will die. Um, and so not to be too melodramatic, but um, I actually claim that actually Americans need to know not just what's in this, but actually truthfully what's in this uh, because this is the backstory. Um, uh, and it's the first of three. Uh, the words that made us 17 constitution, the constitutional conversation um, um, in Philadelphia, in newspapers, in taverns, um, um, uh, in, uh, um, in dining halls, uh, dining rooms. Um, um, but that conversation is 1760 to 1840, the first four school years. Volume two will be the words that made us equal. America's Constitutional Conversation, seven, uh, 1840 to 1920. Um, Seneca Falls, um, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and with women's suffrage. Volume three will be the words that made us modern, America's Constitutional Conversation, 1920 
to 2000, a 240 year saga of America. And if you don't know that story, you have nothing in common with the people actually next to you or when we walk out of this um, building, okay? Because some of our grand great-grandparents um, um, came over hundreds of years ago or, you know, our four, four great, 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 great. And in bull whips, some um, in chains, some families came over yesterday. We have nothing in common. We're, we're not like these other um, uh, nation states that, that are strongly defined by ethnicity or race or religion. We're not that uh, by um, um, uh, literary, uh, by great um, literary works, Goethe or, or Shakespeare or Dante. That's not who Americans are. We are creedal people uh, united by things like the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution, the Gettysburg Address, and what's the relationship among those? That's what this book is about. So you know, you, so you're saying in part then that um, the Constitution was written by the people in the sense that state constitutions copied each other, and then the federal Constitution copies parts of the state Constitution, um, and that there's a conversation among the people up and down the continent. So that's kind of, in a way, a bottom-up story. Um, and yet you spend quite a lot of time, you know, talking about the founders, especially after the Constitution is, uh, is drafted. Um, so, you know, how does that work? It's um, top down meets bottom up in the tradition of Gordon Wood's best books, Empire of Liberty, I would say, and uh, especially um, for Eric Foner's Reconstruction. Um, I'm going to tell you the story about the six great founders. They are all men. By acclamation, they are their first four presidents, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, plus Franklin and Hamilton. So I'm going to tell you those stories, and in part because that's what a general audience expects, and in part because they are really, really important. But um, I'm going to also tell you about how they actually are channeling America. They're not coming up with the ideas in the Declaration of Independence. They're actually combining and collating, um, compiling, um, um, many little um, uh, statements up and down the continent have preceded July 1776. That's Pauline Mayer's book, actually, on American scripture. The Philadelphia Convention is actually just, in effect, cutting and pasting best state practices in the state constitution. So it, it tried to be bottom up, meets, meets top down, doesn't have very many women in it. Because women actually are not central in this early conversation. I, I have stuff from Abigail Adams. Um, and, and, and some stuff, volume two, and, I, and here are my choices. I could actually hand here to certain folks today who want to hear stories about people who look like themselves um, and tell you stories about folks who actually weren't part of the constitutional conversation at the time, but it'll make you feel good, you know, that I find some, some person, obscure person, but that's actually not historically accurate. Or I could tell you the story of this very kind of white, and, and, and male, and it's gonna change, you see, um, in, the, in the next volume, in the volume after, and you will see the significance of when women come on the scene in Seneca Falls, and um, uh, at the end of that book with uh, women's suffrage, and, um, and, um, and when MLK comes on in volume three. So I've chosen to play it um, um, uh, more in an old fashioned way of a certain sort, I'm, um, and old fashioned is gonna, be some, some of it's about the great man because George Washington looms really, really large. And without him, actually, there is no constitution. And that's not what you were taught. You were taught Madison is the key figure. Not at all. Madison is a short little academic. And we, you know, I speak very, you know, a short little like that. <laughs> this, is, this is deep for me. They, we are not listened to the way, you know, the, the, the tall generals are. Uh, so, um, uh, so um, no Washington, no Constitution. That's a different story than you've been taught. But I'm going to tell you about the. And they sometimes agree and they sometimes disagree. I'm trying to suck the reader into a story. I'm trying to write for actually people in AP history, AP government, as well as people on the Supreme Court. And this is cited in the most recent brief. And there are two sentences in this book that might win the case. And I didn't know that they might, when I wrote the thing a couple of years ago, that might win ISL. Um, it's the independent state legislature's But um, so but I think that get, people don't know history. They really don't, and we die. Okay, when I'm, I'm going to be straight with you all. 
When I'm seven years old, I can name all my presidents and there are only three people in this room who can. And this is bad. It really is. And not only name, be able to name them, know who they are, because how are you going to vote for a president every four years if you don't know what a president does, what the job description is, who you think was good and bad, and more people can converse with me genuinely intelligently about how Tom Brady compares to whoever, you know, um, Montana or Manning or Elway or Bart Starr or Johnny Eisenberg, and who the hell cares? Because our civilization does not die if, if, if you can't answer that question or how to think about Aaron Judge versus um, Maris or, 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 or Mays or, or um, um, uh, Ruth or and how to think about the steroid era or something. But people can talk about that intelligently and they don't even know their presence and they have to pick them every four years. So I think the easiest way to suck um, in smart high school students who actually are, are civically minded is through storytelling of a certain sort. Um, uh, and that's biography of a certain sort. And the easiest biography are gonna be some of the most significant figures, the, um, the Alexander Hamiltons of the world. And, and, um, and Alexander Hamilton is an amazing story, only in America. You know, how does a bastard, orphan, son of a whore, you know, and a Scotsman, okay. Like, that's two rap words in the first, you know, 10, you know, bastard and whore. Um, and, Lynn Miranda is telling an amazing story. He's one of the dedicatees of the book, as is his spouse, Vanessa Nadal, as is Ron Chernow, their muse. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna tell you some you know, top-down stories to sort of suck you in, but then I'll tell you, ultimately, it's a story about America and more and more voices will be coming in as the story continues. I and you'll so. see the difference as think, more and more voices come in. I think that some of the some of the ways that you describe the book make it sound a little bit conventional. It's the you know a story that's been told in some ways many times. But I think that when you get to the end of the book and you and you look at the postscript, um, it actually goes through the book and, and tells you all the things that are unconventional and so in in uh, and that are new. You're right. You're right. Andy. And one of the uh, and it's not just uh, themes but also people. So we come, you know, we meet some people in this book that probably most of the people in this room, you know, never heard of or barely heard of. So, for example, who is uh, Thomas Hutchinson? He's the greatest American loyalist. He's on the losing side of the American Revolution, but we need to hear his story too because he's actually an American and he's not a he's not an ogre. He's actually a pretty decent guy who, if he'd been born twenty years before, would never have had to pick between the king that he loves and the town that he loves, which is Boston. And, 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 and how many of you, you know, could actually give me, because I couldn't, this book, I learned a ton in writing it. And I'm so telling you stuff that I didn't know um, or that I was taught the opposite, like it's Madison, it's not, it's Washington. How many of you could, could actually, who haven't read the book, give me a paragraph on Thomas Hutchinson? And he's the most important loyalist. You, you might be able to tell me about Benedict Arnold, but Benedict Arnold is not a thinker of any sort. And Thomas Hutchinson is. Um, and Thomas Hutchinson, um, if he were alive today, I'm a Democrat. Um, he's basically, but he's a very, you know, um, honorable, decent kind of company man, hierarchical conservative, um, very intelligent, very smart, brilliant businessman. He's basically Mitt Romney. And Mitt Romney is not an evil person at all. And, and I'm a Democrat, okay? Um, but if you don't know, not just the Patriots side, the Patrick Henrys and the James Otises, whom you probably don't know that much about, and, and the big six that I told you about, if you only know that side and you don't know the other side of the conversation, you don't know what the American Revolution was in part about because about 20% of Americans are loyalists. And I'm gonna show you the best loyalists and what they were trying to say, why in the end, I'm, I'm with the Patriots, but at the beginning, actually, the loyalists have a lot to be said for them, and I try to be fair to them. This isn't just winner's history. Um, so, so Thomas Hutchinson is this really interesting guy, and he has the nicest house in town in Boston, and it's completely destroyed by the mob. Um, and I wrote this before January 6th. And um, let me actually just read to you, um, because no one has ever heard this speech before. And it's in three books of the last you know, 100 years. They completely destroy his house. He's the chief judge of 
um, the, the Massachusetts court because they think he's actually a tool. He's actually not. He's been completely fighting for, he doesn't like paying taxes any more than anyone else, um, but um, he's doing it in a quiet insider way. And he shows up in the courtroom the next day after they've, he escaped just barely with his life. Um, um, and, um, and here's um, what they do. They, he barely escaped with his skin, um, not content to wreck the building, destroy the trees. What did the trees do? You know, um, to the, the, loot the or, ordinary household items such as silverware, china, carpets, bedding, clothing, furniture, paintings, and ready money. The writers also assaulted the very emblems and instruments of reason and discourse, the very tools of America's fledgling constitutional conversation by destroying or hurling in the mud many of Hutchinson's books and papers. Among the casualties were manuscript drafts of a provincial history series that Hutchinson was writing for posterity, along with a trove of historical documents that he painstakingly collected for 30s. He's actually trying to collect all these things so that we today can know the history and they throw it all in the mud and clear to you. This is written maybe before January 6th. He escapes with his life by this much. He shows up the next day in court because he's needed to make a quorum and he doesn't have his robes on. And here's what he says. Gentlemen, and it's gendered. Some apology is necessary for my dress. Indeed, I had no other. Destitute of everything, no other shirt, no other garment, but what I have on, and not one in my whole family in a better situation than myself. I'm obliged to borrow this part of this clothing. Um, uh, I am innocent of all the charges, and all the charges against me are false. I call God to witness that I never, in New England or old, in Great Britain or America, neither directly or indirectly, aided, assisted, or supported in the least promoted or encouraged was commonly called the Stamp Act. On the contrary, I did all in my power and strove as, as much in me like to prevent it, but he didn't tell other people this because he was he's a quiet guy. This is declared not through timidity, for I have nothing to fear. They can only take away my life. It's very pious. I pray the eyes of the people will be opened, that they will see how easy it is for some designing, wicked man to sp spread false reports to raise suspicion and jealousy in the minds of the populace and raise them, enrage them against the innocent, Trump. Oh no, excuse me. Um, I pray God give us better hearts, okay? And I wrote that before January 6th and he's on the other side, but he's a decent person and he was very badly treated. And so I tell stories so that you will understand the drama that, that, that created, the dramas that created our, our system. But I think there's also, you know, subtlety in the in these stories. So, for example, you contrast this with the uh, Tea Party. Ah, yeah, the Tea Party is so cool because it's it's Gandhi, it's Mandela, it's um, uh, uh, MLK, avant la lettre, because no one dies in that. It's um, 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 it, property is destroyed, but but no um, person. It's it's political theater of a very impressive sort oh and it's also racist because they're actually dressing up as native americans and i talk about all of that okay um, so what kinds of popular protests are actually proper what kinds are actually improper how do we distinguish among them um because um and, and so i think rioting that happened on january 6th or the looting that has happened in some places is very different than the peaceful protests you know, that we've seen over the last couple of years and uh, several years. And so I talk about all that because that is mass. It, it, there's a lot of bottom up in this, um, um, but there's also a lot of top down. So meanwhile, what we're talking about so far is mostly history. And so it is a book of history, but it's also a, a lawyer's book, right? I mean, it's, it's also a, a book about law, constitution is law, um, American law. So um, how do you put the two together? you know, into a cohesive story that, you know, maybe someone like, that, that requires, you know, a legal scholar to tell. What's the importance of that? Yeah, so I'm slipping in law wherever I can, but I'm trying to actually um, make, have it go down easy. America's Constitution of Biography is very dense. It's, you know, it goes through the Constitution textually, and it's legal issue, legal issue, legal issue. And, and I'm proud of it, um, but... It does, it, there's not a lot of narrative and storytelling and, and character development. Um, and it, it, it's it's um, shorter, but parts of it feel like a treatise a little bit. Um, and I say that I'm not embarrassed to, you know, uh, uh, that we need treatises, um, but this one, 
I want it to feel like a Ron Chernow, David McCullough, a kind of just, you know, history book. But here's, I, I loved David McCullough. He's, he was a dear friend. His grandson is my student, and I'm actually on the um, uh, board of a charity that uh, uh, David has created. You're going to hear all about it. It's called the American Exchange Project. It's about getting Americans from different parts of the country in high school to actually um, visit each other and spend time with each other. It's like AFS, but within America. It's going to be very big. And, and this is David the Younger's uh, brainchild. I, I really was very close to his, his grandfather. He's a great man, Yale College. Um, but David McCullough is a storyteller and not an analyst. So he's not going to actually give you an analytic take on the three-fifths clause. Um, or um, he writes a whole book about John Adams. It's a lovely biography. And he doesn't really spend very much time on this alien sedition acts. And you have to, because you need to understand why John Adams uniquely, and he's, he's in my first chapter, and he's in my last chapter, and everything in between. But John Adams gets thrown out on his ass, okay? He's the only one um, who doesn't get reelected, you know, because there was this pandemic. No, 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 I'm getting confused by another person who got thrown out. Okay, because um, he makes it a crime to criticize Donald Trump. He makes it a crime to criticize John Adams. And you can't. Yes, because you have to understand why Trump is so malignant. And if you don't understand in America, you can't make it a crime to criticize the president. You're going to miss stuff, pretty important stuff. John Adams, George Washington gets reelected and would have been reelected unanimously a third time if he'd run, he didn't. Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, all reelected. Adams, not. Why not? because he makes it a crime to criticize John Adams. And I need to tell you then why the Sedition Act was actually really bad. And my friend, David McCullough, is gonna write a book that's really compulsively readable, but he's not gonna give you legal analysis. And in order to decide about the Sedition Act, I'm gonna to have to tell you that there's no federal common law of crimes. How many of you have ever heard of a case called United States versus Hudson and Goodwin? Please raise your hands. Turns out to be one of the most important cases of all time. Raise your hands high. Yeah, you guys have read the book. Okay. So, and if you don't know that there's no federal common law of crimes, like, ooh, what's common law? Ooh, that's because we're supposed to be a law school, you see, and we don't always teach it. It will be on the bar. Okay. So you need to know actually that there's no federal com and I'm not making, I'm not saying an Erie point. Erie doesn't say there's no federal common law, by the way. Erie says there's no general federal common law, but there is federal common law, but there's no federal common law of crimes. The case that says that is United States versus Hudson and Goodwin, and it's connected to the Sedition Act, and you need to know all of that, and I will tell it to you in the course of explaining why John Adams is thrown out on his ass, which truthfully, um, David McCullough doesn't want to talk about very much, because he's too nice a guy, and it's not a, you know, a, it's not a flattering story about, it. and Abigail doesn't come out looking particularly good in this either. Um, she's too thin-skinned. John is definitely too thin-skinned. Or I'll just give you like another example. Um, I talked about this in the, this is the class that just ended. Um, the most important case the Supreme Court decided before Marbury is a case that almost none of you have ever even heard of. It's a case called Hylton versus United States. How many of you actually were taught in con law? It's a case about the taxing power. Some of you might have been taught in the tax class. The guy that argues it is Alexander Hamilton. It's the only case he ever argues. It's a brilliant, or he wins unanimously. Madison's on the other side because Madison's a nitwit on a whole bunch of things, on the bank, on taxes, on armies. The capital burns to the ground on his watch. So he's way overestimated in these standard narratives, which come from Southerners in various ways. And so when I tell you the stories about these people, where they agree and disagree, I'm going to do legal analysis again and again and again on the tax power, on the, uh, what we, the, the First Amendment, on uh, um, uh, uh, federal common law of crimes, on McCulloch, um, um, uh, and so on, and, and, and so on. Um, so, but I'm going to do it in a way that I hope doesn't actually um, chase away a high schooler who wants just a general, you know, big story of um, uh, America over the first 80 years. Right. And we did a whole podcast episode on it because it's quite relevant to questions of uh, wealth tax that may come up soon. If, if, um, if Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders' big projects are ever going to come to fruition, we're going to need more taxes. Wealth taxes are a possible source. 
and a bunch of people say they're unconstitutional. I disagree. I think I've got the best argument about why they're not and traces through Alexander Hamilton and Hylton, and you will not find it anywhere except in this book. You see, just like, I think I've got a good argument about ISL, okay? So you need to know how to do constitutional law and originalism, and I'm gonna do it again and again. And sometimes I actually am aware this will have significance today. This is about the Wealth Act. Sometimes I had no idea that some of the sentences that I wrote actually about John Adams are gonna be at the heart of, of something. So here, here's a sentence from John Adams, mm -hmm. and it turns out, it's the heart of the ISL case, which is about the relationship between this, inter, uh, um, this independent state legislature theory. What's the relationship between state laws and state constitutions? Because some people say oh, state legislatures can actually they disregard the state constitution as construed by the state Supreme Court. On May 17th, and I wrote this not knowing this was going to be important, but this is, is front and center in the brief. This might persuade Clarence Thomas. In, on May 17, 1776, John wrote Abigail. He had just successfully championed a two-part resolution urging each colony to form its own government, entirely free from any political or legal connection to Georgia III or Britain. Now, this is, remember, two months before um, July, okay? And John Adams understands this is the key moment. This resolution, he explains to, he explains to Abigail, with a mixture of pride and awe, was tantamount to absolute independence. In his view, confederation among ourselves or alliances with foreign nations are not logically necessary to perfect separation from Britain. Confederations and alliances you know, were uh, mere sort of tactical means to the ultimate end, the true prize. Here's the true prize. While confederate, this is all quote, while confederation will be necessary for our internal concord and alliances may be so for our external defense, the real reward will be the freedom of Massachusetts and every other Maine colony to choose its own government and then to govern itself. State constitution, we're gonna be about our own. Here's the quote. A whole government of our own choice managed by persons whom we love, revere, and can confide in has charms in it for which men will fight. That's what they're fighting about, actually. State constitution. So what I write in, the, in my own words is, if we're to understand what all the shouting was about in 1776, what the main point of the conversation was, we must first ponder the state constitutions that sprouted like so many daffodils up and down the continent in the springtime of the new world. I'm gonna tell you when actually constitutionalism comes to America and it comes first in states, and that's at the heart of the ISL case and the guys on the other side don't understand any of that.